This is Cerebral Cinema. Movies of the Mind. Kremel Hair Tonic and Kremel Shampoo present the new adventures of Sherlock Holmes, starring Nigel Bruce as Dr. Watson and Tom Conway as Sherlock Holmes. Once again, it's time to drop in for a visit with our old friend, Dr. Watson, storyteller beyond compare and confidant of the immortal Sherlock Holmes. And here he is, waiting to greet us in his familiar study. Good evening, Dr. Watson. I must admit that on such a cold and foggy evening, your fireplace looks even more cheery than usual. And a very good evening to you, Mr. Bell. Here, come and sit down. Ah, this chair feels good. <laughs> Thank you, Dr. Watson. Nasty night out. Yes, it certainly is. In weather like this, I find my old wound gives me an occasional twinge. Giselle Bullitt, you know, souvenir of a border skirmish in Afghanistan. <laughs> Long before you were born, my boy. I've always been amazed, Dr. Watson, that with all the tight spots you and Sherlock Holmes found yourselves in, you were fortunate enough to escape with only one bullet wound. Yes, Holmes used to say that I was born to be hanged. <laughs> but I can remember more than one narrow escape. As a matter of fact, there's a souvenir of one of them right before you on the mantelpiece. On the mantelpiece? Oh. Small pot of ivy, a framed photograph of you and Mr. Holmes, two sporting prints, and a small blue saucer. Huh, not very exciting. You see, Mr. Bell, but you do not observe, as my friend Sherlock Holmes used to say. Oh. That small blue saucer from which an ordinary house cat was accustomed to eat its evening meal was the key that saved an innocent man from the shadow of the gallows and brought a fiendishly clever murderer to justice. You will find it among my notes, under the heading of the clue of the hungry cat. And Dr. Watson, I can hardly wait for the story. But first, here's something I'd like to pass along to you men. Every up-and-coming man today wants to look like a success. And neatly groomed hair adds so much to a man's appearance. So may I please suggest Kremel hair tonic? See if you don't agree that there's all the difference in the world in Kremel. Kremel keeps dry, stubborn hair in perfect order from morning till night. It gives hair a nice, attractive luster, too. Yet Kremel never plasters hair down with thick, dust-catching grease. It never leaves hair looking or feeling sticky or gummy. Kremel goes in for modern, more natural-looking hair grooming. The kind in such great demand today. Why not try it, men? K-R-E-M-L. Kremel Hair Tonic. Now, Dr. Watson, how about the clue of the hungry cat? Well, Mr. Bell, it all began one day when Holmes and I, finding it a bit early for lunch as we walked down the Strand, turned into the old bailey, wondering if the jury had yet brought in the verdict in a sensational murder case which Holmes had been following in the papers with considerable interest. As we entered the courtroom, we heard the clerk of the court saying... Prisoner at the bar, you stand convicted of murder by the verdict of a jury of your peers. Have you anything to say before judgment is pronounced upon you? Only, my lord and gentlemen of the jury, that I am innocent of this crime. <laughs> Silence in the court. Robert Saunders, you have been found guilty of the murder of Amanda Post. The sentence of this court is that you be taken to that place from whence you came. And that two weeks from today, on the 12th of October, you'll be hanged by the neck until you are dead. And may the Lord have mercy on your soul. I must say, that fellow Saunders had it coming to him, Holmes. Open and shut case, if I ever heard one. I wonder, Watson. Oh, now, really, Holmes, even you can't find anything to wonder about in the killing of that poor woman. Her husband was away, that fellow Saunders saw his chance, broke into the house, robbed Mr. Post's cash box, and evidently woke up Mrs. Post. He knew that she'd recognize him, so he made quite sure that she'd never testify by choking the poor woman to death. He then tried to burn the house down to conceal his crime. Huh. 
If you ask me, hanging's too good for him. The cash box is what intrigues me, Watson. And what, pray, is intriguing about the cash box? Why, that fellow son has admitted that he stole eight pounds out of it. Can him. you tell me, Watson, why any sane man, and I heard no testimony adduced to prove that Sanders was insane, should steal the sum of eight pounds out of a cash box that contained 65? Oh, well, let me see. Well, perhaps the uh, fellow was uh, suddenly frightened. Or the balance might have been in large notes that could have been traced. No way to the chops for me, the Haddocks, Mr. Holmes. Oh, very good, sir. Sorry, Watson, but I can't accept your alternatives. Sanders' only defense, and I grant you that it was a feeble one, was that Mr. Post had owed him eight pounds, and that that was his reason for taking only that sum. Oh, delicious. They, they do a chop here better, better than any place in London. And <laughs> I suppose you believe Sanders' story. Despite your evident amusement, I do. Well, all I can say, Holmes, is that... Look, that uh, girl over there in the corner, the one who's crying into her handkerchief, didn't we see her in the court just now? Not only did we see her, but as you should know from the drawings which have been published in every newspaper these last few days, she's the fiancée of the convicted man. I say, Holmes, where are you going? Come along, Watson. My curiosity is aroused. Good heavens, the last time your curiosity was aroused, I found myself in the Sahara Desert in the middle of July. I beg your pardon, Miss Caldwell. Oh. I couldn't help noticing your evident distress. And although I don't wish to hold out any false hopes, let me assure you that I share your belief that your fiancé has been convicted of a crime of which he's innocent. You really? Oh, leave me alone. You're another of those newspaper reporters. I assure you, my dear, that I'm not. My name is Sherlock Holmes. Sherlock Holmes? Oh, Mr. Holmes. You really believe that Bob is innocent? Your fiancé, Miss Caldwell, is a young man of good education and very evident intelligence. I cannot bring myself to believe that he stupidly and brutally killed Mrs. Post to conceal a minor theft. Oh, Mr. Holmes, I can't tell you what it means to me just to hear you say that. Wait, even Mr. Briggs, when he was defending Bob in that horrible courtroom, didn't speak as though he believed Bob's own story. But it's true. I know it's true. I... I haven't much money, Mr. Holmes, but if you It's not a question of money, Miss Caldwell. I have an ingrained prejudice against seeing the innocent convicted. Suppose you come with Dr. Watson and myself while we pay a visit to the scene of the crime. As the next-door neighbor of the house where the tragedy occurred, Mrs. Roberts... Won't you tell us in your own words just what happened? Well, Mr. Holmes, although it was some time ago, it still uh, catches me all of a sudden when I think of it. There takes me aback, it does. Sometimes I come all over dizzy like... Uh, too much gin, if you ask me. Quiet, Watson. Mm -hmm. I can well believe it, Mrs. Roberts. But please, Mrs. Roberts, won't you tell Mr. Holmes what you remember? Well, that morning Mr. Post was going away on business to Brighton. Uh, going to be gone a couple of days, he was. Now, around noontime, I happened to look out of me window. Not that I'm the type that's forever mind in other people's business, you'll understand. And I seen him a standing in the front door just as he was a saying goodbye to her. Saying? But I understood from the evidence that Mrs. Post was stone deaf. When I say saying, I mean he was waving goodbye to her, like he always did when he went away. Did you see Mrs. Post wave back to him? Well, in a manner of speaking, yes. At least I seen the curtain move inside the front parlor window, so I guess she was a-waving to him from inside. Mm, fairly conclusive, Holmes. The poor woman was alive when her husband left, and she was dead after the fire. No one else could possibly have killed her. Bob didn't. I don't care what you say. And after Mr. Post left, Mrs. Roberts, what happened then? Nothing. I was busy with me housework. Frying up a nice bit of fish for me old man's supper, I was. And I didn't notice nothing next door until about 8 o'clock that evening. 8 o'clock? But the fire wasn't until midnight. But maybe it's silly of me to mention it. It wasn't anything important. When a murder has been committed, Mrs. Roberts, no fact is unimportant. Well, I never did. It was only at about 8 o'clock, a cat Minnie came scratching and yowling around me back door. Angry she was. Hmm. Most enlightening. No, really, Holmes. Was that the cat's usual habit, Mrs. Roberts? No. Amanda Post was loony about that cat. Gave it its supper every night at six regular. Liver she used to feed it at sixpence a pound. Now that's scandalous, if you ask me, with poor people starving. Yes, I see. Then what did you do? Well, I fed the cat, 
And then I went to bed. And the old man and I were as sound asleep as two blessed angels in paradise when we heard the fire engines. <laughs> The place is going up like a tinderbox. If there's anyone in there, there's nothing we can do for them now. Oh, it was horrible hearing them say that, Mr. Holmes. We were still thinking the deaf as she was. Poor Mrs. Post had not been awakened by the crackle of the flames. And it wasn't until the next day, when the men from Scotland Yard were looking around the wreckage, that they told us that she'd been strangled in her bed before the fire ever started. Strangled by that smooth-spoken, murdering young devil, that Robert Sands. No, it isn't true. That's a lie. Bob couldn't... Control yourself, please, my dear Miss Caldwell. Thank you, Mrs. Roberts. I greatly appreciate the assistance you've given us. Good day. Oh, not at all, Mr. Holmes. It's been a pleasure, I'm sure. But, Mr. Holmes, all that woman's evidence came out in court. There's nothing there to help you set Robert free. Well, I'm afraid you're right. I'm dashed if I can make head or tail out of that stream of nonsense that that woman spouted at us. Don't be too hasty, Watson. I should like to call your attention to the curious incident of Minnie's supper. But that night, the cat didn't get her supper. That was the curious incident. <laughs> Will you put down that violin for a moment and pay attention? This is the third time since we got home that you've interrupted what I'm sure might prove a magnificent composition, my dear Watson. What's the matter now? Well, listen to this note. My dear Mr. Holmes, may I request your immediate presence at my home on a matter of the greatest possible importance? I enclose my check for 500 guineas. As a retainer, signed Geoffrey Brookfield. In brackets, the Earl of Brookfield. 500 guinea retainer. You, you calmly sit here on Baker Street, playing the violin. If you like, you may write to Lord Brookfield and tell what? him that the paintings over which he's so worried have been sold by his son to provide jewels for the dancer with whom the young man is enamored. And uh, send his check back to him with my compliments. Come in. Yes, Mrs. Hudson, what is it? A uh, gentleman to see Mr. Holmes, sir. A uh, Mr. Post. Mr. Post? Oh, yes. Show him up, will you, please? Yes, sir. You act as though you expected this fellow Post. When I put a ferret down a hole, Watson, I usually do so in expectation of starting a rabbit. You mean those questions of yours, Mrs. Roberts, this afternoon? Our huh? garrulous friend, Mrs. Roberts, is not the type to keep a visit from Sherlock Holmes a secret from the neighborhood. Mr. Post, Mr. Holmes. Good evening, Mr. Post. Uh, Mr. Sherlock Holmes? Quite. And this is my friend and colleague, Dr. Watson. Good evening, sir. Uh, doctor. Uh, won't you sit down? Uh, thank you, thank you, Mr. Holmes. I prefer to stand. I, uh, I must confess I'm somewhat upset by what my former neighbor, Mrs. Roberts, told me this evening. Oh? What was that? Uh, that you and Dr. Watson and that young woman were asking questions this afternoon. There's nothing for you to be upset about, Mr. Post. But I confess that the unfortunate matter of your late wife's death had certain features which seemed to me odd, shall we say? But this morning, Sanders was found guilty and condemned to be hanged. I'm aware of that. But as long as you're here, Mr. Post, I'm sure you won't mind answering a question or two. Not at all. Though I fail to oh, see... Oh, do, do sit down, Mr. Post. You're making me nervous, walking back and forth, back I'm and sorry. forth. I'm sorry. I'm awfully sorry, Doctor. Ever since this horrible thing happened... I can't seem to sit oh, still. Oh, yes, yes, of course. I'm so sorry. Uh, this fellow Sanders, a former employee of yours, wasn't he, Mr. Post? He was, he was. I sacked him. The fellow was always nosing about things that didn't concern him. And according to him, you still owed him eight pounds back wages. Oh, not a bit of truth to it. I'm sure there wasn't. After all, a matter of eight pounds could mean very little to you. You'll pardon my mentioning it, Mr. Post, but uh, you must be a man of considerable wealth now. If you mean since my wife's death, yes, I am. When I came to England from Australia a couple of years ago, all I had was a few hundred pounds and some business experience. I met and married my dear Amanda within the past year, Mr. Holmes, and a finer wife no man ever had. I can assure you that I'd give all the wealth she left me and a dozen times over to have her back with me. Of course, of course. The sentiment does you credit, sir. Quite. And now that I've met you, Mr. Post, let me assure you that any doubts I may have had in the matter are entirely resolved. Ah, I'm glad to hear it, Mr. Holmes. You'll pardon my intrusion, but 
Well, you understand. Yes, indeed, sir. Indeed, uh, indeed. Good night, gentlemen. Uh, good night, sir. Good night, Mr. Post. Mm, pleasant fellow. Well, Holmes, I'm glad that your doubts have finally been set at rest. Yes. Any lingering doubts I may have had as to Sanders' innocence have now been completely removed. Hmm? Sanders' innocence? Watson, does it occur to you that there's something about our friend Mr. Post that doesn't quite ring true? Oh, come, 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 Holmes. Seemed to me a fine, upstanding fuller. But did you happen to notice his curious way of pacing up and down? Well, the poor man's overwrought. Probably can't keep still. It's natural enough being a doctor. Our I sitting feel... room, Watson, is 23 feet in length, with no obstructions in the area where Mr. Post chose to do his pacing. Yet he turned automatically again and again at each end of what I estimate to be an eight-foot walk. Eight foot? What are you driving at? Eight feet, Watson, happens to be exactly the length of a prison cell. In just a moment, we rejoin Sherlock Holmes and Dr. Watson as they try to solve the mystery of the strange death of Amanda Post. Did you know that a recent survey showed Kreml hair tonic was the hair tonic preferred among America's top flight executives and better dressed men? Well, this isn't at all surprising because Kreml is famous for giving hair that smooth, well-groomed appearance for which there is no substitute. And what's so important Kreml does lots more than just keep hair looking handsome. Kreml removes dandruff flakes. It promptly relieves itching of scalp due to dryness and actually helps condition the hair in that it leaves it feeling so much softer. Notice how much easier your hair is to comb, how every lock falls right in place and stays that way all day long. And remember, whereas Kreml gives hair a rich, attractive luster, it never leaves hair looking or feeling greasy. Ask for an application of Kreml at your barber shop. Buy a bottle at any drugstore. K-R-E-M-L. Kreml hair tonic. And now, Dr. Watson, what did Sherlock Holmes do after he called your attention to the odd behavior of Mr. Well, Post? it was too late that night for us to do anything. Although Holmes did send off a cable to Australia asking for all available information on the mysterious Mr. Post. But... Bright and early the next morning, Holmes and I set off in a hansom cab, almost before I'd finished my breakfast. Our destination being the fire brigade station nearest the late Mrs. Post's house. You're convinced the fire was incendiary, Captain? No, no question in my mind at all, Mr. Holmes. Blazing like a Guy Fawkes piece it was by the time we got there. After we finally had a wetted down, there was a smell of paraffin oil strong enough to choke you all over the place. So you very rightly sent for the police? Oh, I did bet, sir, just as soon as I found that poor woman lying dead in her bed. Or was left a bit... Though I thought she died of suffocation. Well, oh, the medical evidence that she'd been strangled before the fire started was clear enough. I know, Dr. Richardson, a sound man. Very sound. Uh... And it was you who found the cash box, Captain? Uh, yes, Mr. Holmes. Being of stout metal, it hadn't come to no harm. Very hot fire like that sometimes is a freakish way of burning some things to a crisp and leaving others almost undamaged. The thing we often see in our business. I wish I could have inspected the house the morning after the fire. Watson, this shows you the disadvantage of attempting to follow a cold trail. Well, I'm sure I don't know what you expect to find. I don't know myself, but there must be something. Perhaps it won't do you any good, Mr. Holmes, because it's a regular ragbag collection of odds and ends. But most of the things from Mrs. Post's bedroom are right back there on that table in the corner. Ah. Those that weren't too badly burned. Uh, they would have been thrown out this morning. The police made us keep them until after the tire. Capital. Capital. Yeah, you're welcome to take a look at them, sir. Phew. Smells more like a salvage sale. Curious looking collection. And what is that horrible looking object? Uh, some kind of a stuffed fish that was mounted on a plaque. It says souvenir of Brighton. Mm -hmm. And over there is the poor woman's horsehair <laughs> pillow. That's hard stuff to burn. What's this? Uh, oh, a Bible with its covers burned off. And an alarm clock that had been on the bureau. We still ran when we picked it up, as a matter of fact. Set for noon, I see. And this strange looking thing turned out to be the late Mrs. Post's corset. Uh, all that was left of it. Uh, Rather gruesome, I must say. Makes me think of the relics we'll all have to leave behind when we shuffle off this mortal coil. Eh? Don't be morbid, Watson. Oh, sorry. And uh, mm -hmm. here's some silver that was on the dresser. And these pieces of the pitcher and basin and the soap dish. I'm afraid that's the whole collection. Well, not much to be learnt from that, eh, Holmes? As I've told you on previous occasions, Watson, 
You see, but you do not observe. And what, may I ask, is to be observed from this insanitary and odorous collection? Only enough, I trust, to remove Robert Sanders from the shadow of the gallows and to substitute the estimable Mr. Post in his place. Good gracious me. <laughs> Would you be good enough, Watson, to ring for Mrs. Hudson? All right, Holmes, if you say so, but how you expect the frightened post into confessing that he murdered his wife and then set the house on fire while he was 50 miles away in Brighton is, is beyond me. You are in possession of the same facts that I am, Watson, and since you know my methods, you should be able to reach the same conclusion. I must admit... Come in. Oh, you're right, Mr. Holmes? We're expecting a visitor, Mrs. Hudson. Mr. Post, who was here last night. Oh, I remember him, sir. A very nice gentleman. He tipped me a shilling on his way out. I have reason to think that he'll be here very shortly. Will you show him up as soon as he arrives? All right, sir. You were saying? I was about to say that the problem no longer lies in the solution of the crime. That, of course, is obvious to anyone. Well, sir, of course. Certainly, obvious. The difficulty is I haven't a shred of evidence. Therefore, the only possibility of justice being done is through forcing a confession from Mr. Post by suddenly facing him with an utterly unexpected reconstruction of what actually happened. I suggest, Watson, that you arm yourself with your service revolver. I have reason to think that Mr. Post may react violently. Really? Loaded and ready. But I do think, Holmes, that if you're so sure that Post is a murderer, you might at least tell the police. I very much doubt if Scotland Yard would admit itself completely in the wrong without proof, which, of course, I haven't got. No, Watson, I must... Come in. Uh, good evening, Mr. Holmes. Dr. Watson. Good evening. I received your note, Mr. Holmes, asking me to call on you at once on a matter of the greatest importance. I'm sorry to trouble you at this hour of night, Mr. Post, but there have been one or two puzzling questions in connection with your wife's death which have been bothering Dr. Watson and myself. But I thought you said last night that all your doubts had been resolved. They had, Mr. Post. But I didn't specify what doubts. I'm afraid you're being a bit cryptic. I must beg you, Mr. Holmes, to come to the point. Very well, Mr. Post. Let me present you a reconstruction of what I can only term a highly ingenious crime. I'm listening. A certain man who for the moment shall be nameless meets and courts a wealthy woman who, despite the handicap of her deafness, is still attractive and marries her. Very interesting, Mr. Holmes. Then, ruthlessly and in cold blood, he strangles this poor, foolish, credulous woman, knowing that under her will he will inherit her fortune. I know what you're insinuating, and I... Then you admit... I, I admit nothing. There's no reason why I have to stay here and listen to you insult my wife's memory. Sit down, Mr. Post. What? You don't dare leave till you discover just how much I really do know. Very well, Mr. Holmes. And just how does this man do what you say he did without getting caught? After he's strangled her and his other preparations have been made, he stands in the front door of their house, ostensibly waving goodbye to the wife who already lies dead upon her bed. Holmes, Mrs. Roberts said that... Uh... The fond farewell is answered, Watson, by a curtain that moves in one of the front windows. Who is there to know that the curtain has merely moved at the twitch of a string held in the murderer's hand? At... Uh... At least, Mr. Holmes, I must congratulate you on your ingenuity. But there were a couple of things the husband overlooked. First, Minnie, his wife's pet cat. Minnie comes to the back door at the usual hour. Her plaintive search and scratchings produce no result. And why? Because the wife who usually feeds Minnie already lies dead. That's what you meant, Holmes. Precisely, Watson. After which the house is silent until midnight, when suddenly a fire breaks forth. A fire of such intensity as to consume almost all the evidence of the crime. And... Most important of all, a fire which was meant to produce in the eye of the beholder an unshakable alibi for the husband, who at that moment was so far away. The fact that Sanders chose to break in that same night was sheer good luck for the murderer, for he gave the police a ready-made suspect. And now let me ask you one question, Mr. Holmes. Just how did the husband of whom you speak produce this conflagration while he was at least 50 miles away? Probably by means of some simple attachment connected to the alarm clock in his wife's room. Which was set to go off at 12 midnight, Watson, not 12 noon, as you surmised. Good heavens, Holmes. An attachment which was later destroyed by the heat of the fire. Very pretty piece of fiction, Mr. Holmes. Of course, it would never stand up in a court of law. I'm not so sure, Mr. Post. Oh, I am. After all, it would just be your word against mine. Yes. The word of Sherlock Holmes against that of an ex-convict. Why, you... Two of whose previous wives died in Australia under suspicious circumstances. I won't listen to any more. What's been said is sufficient. They'll never get me for those other two, nor for this one Then you'll do it, mate. Yes, yes! 
I killed my wife. But you never see you me in a Nice work, Watson. Is he badly hurt? Oh, I don't think so. Just a flesh wound in his shoulder. Knocked him out for a few minutes, that's all. <laughs> He'll live, I'm afraid. Watson, if you hadn't shot first... Oh, there's nothing, my dear fellow, nothing at all. Don't mention no fellow. Uh, uh, tell me, how did you ever deduce that whole story just from the fact that the cat didn't get her supper? I didn't, Watson. Oh, uh, you said that... Uh, the incident of the cat's supper served to make me suspicious. I only became certain at the fire station when I saw the alarm clock. But, Holmes, I saw that alarm clock. Seemed like a perfectly orderly clock to me. As I remarked before, Watson, you see, but you do not observe. Why would a woman who is stone deaf have set an alarm clock to waken her at 12 o'clock? Well, of all the blind idiots. <laughs> Quite. And uh, now, chap, ring for Mrs. Hudson, will you? I think perhaps the police might be interested in our friend, Mr. Post. And was Mr. Post convicted, Dr. Watson? Oh, he was, Mr. Bell, when he was confronted with the evidence in court, plus the cablegram that Holmes had received from Australia, telling about Post's rather murky past. He went all to pieces broke down and confessed everything. Of course, Robert Saunders was immediately set free. I see. And now, Dr. Watson, before you tell us about next week's story, may I ask our lady listeners this question? Oh, of course, my dear fellow, of course. Did you know that the makers of Cremel Hair Tonic also make a remarkably beautifying shampoo? Yes, and quite naturally, it's called Cremel Shampoo. The famous Powers models were among the first to discover its amazingly beautifying action. And here's their consensus of opinion. There's nothing better than Cremel shampoo to keep hair shining bright for days. Each tiny strand just gleaming with natural glossy luster. Cremel shampoo works like magic, even in the hardest water. Its rich, active foam penetrates right to the scalp and removes all loose dandruff as well as the dirt. Oh, and don't forget about its beneficial oil base. This helps keep hair from becoming dry or brittle and leaves the hair so much softer and silkier. We always use cremel shampoo at our house. And my wife is smart. She buys the large family size. K-R-E-M-L. Cremel shampoo. And now, Dr. Watson, what about next week? Well, now let me see. Next week, next week I think I'll tell you about the incredible and rather grim happenings that transpired in the ancestral home of the Burleys on the storm-swept Cornish coast. And how Sherlock Holmes once again came to grips with that arch fiend of crime, the sinister Professor Moriarty. Tonight's new Sherlock Holmes adventure was suggested by an incident in Sir Arthur Conan Doyle's story, The Boscombe Valley Mystery. Nigel Bruce appeared by permission of California Pictures. And Tom Conway through the courtesy of Eagle Lion Pictures. This is Joseph Bell speaking for Kremel Hair Tonic and Kremel Shampoo. And inviting you to be with us next week at this same time. When Dr. Watson will tell us about Sherlock Holmes' encounter with Professor Moriarty. is ABC, the American Broadcasting Company. Cerebral Cinema hopes you have enjoyed this movie of the mind.